EPSCOR is changing the nation. Since the first jurisdictions received awards in 1980, EPSCOR funding impacts echo throughout the country via research findings, infrastructure improvements, outreach to local educators, and diverse people. New Mexico EPSCOR is no exception. Our jurisdiction began in 2001, and in that short time, we have catalyzed the development of new knowledge, broadened participation in STEM, established sustainable pathways to STEM education, and impacted research and economic development. Today, we are four years into our fourth Research Infrastructure Improvement Award, Energize New Mexico. Our reach extends far beyond our state office in Albuquerque, from the remote areas of the Navajo Nation in the northwest to the oil fields of the Permian Basin in the southeast. Since we can't take you to see the impacts of New Mexico EPSCO around the state, in the next 30 minutes, we will take you on a virtual journey of these locations, covering over a thousand miles of road. Of course, we'll take you to our main research universities, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, and New Mexico Tech in Socorro. But you'll also get to see research at Eastern New Mexico University in Portales and Santa Fe Community College in Santa Fe, plus field sites on Laguna Pueblo, outside Truth or Consequences, on the Permian Basin, on the Navajo Nation, and in the Jemez Mountains. So hold on to your seats, because here we go. The climate is changing rapidly, and the world needs new fuel alternatives to oil and gas without wasting resources, especially water. Algal biomass, organic matter derived from algae, could potentially contribute significantly to new renewable fuel standards. Algae, both theoretically and empirically, is likely to have up to five times the productivity compared to other plant-based fuel sources, like corn or sugar. The challenges to algal biofuels as a sustainable fuel include cultivation, the cost of harvesting, and scaling reactors up from benchtop to large outdoor production systems. That's why Energize New Mexico's bioalgal energy component looks for solutions that make use of non-traditional organisms and contaminated water in order to generate knowledge about algal biology and practical applications of biofuels. The Bioalgal Energy Team is comprised of faculty and students at the University of New Mexico, New Mexico State University, and Eastern New Mexico University, with additional personnel and infrastructure at Western New Mexico University in Silver City, Santa Fe Community College, and the New Mexico Consortium in Los Alamos. Each location contributes their piece of a larger puzzle. The University of New Mexico is focused on the natural growth of algae, algae encapsulation, and biofuels conversion. Team members under Dr. David Hansen pursue novel ways to cultivate algae while maintaining photosynthetic function. Recent experiments show gel encapsulation increases the lifespan of algae cells while boosting its metabolism and protecting it from bacteria and other predators. This protection allows for infinite harvest of algae byproducts. Dr. Becky Bixby is more concerned with extremophiles, organisms that can survive harsh conditions such as extreme temperature. So I'm sampling the biofilms that are on the outside surface of soda dam. It's wet, drippy, and I'm interested in the algal communities and the microbial communities. I'm sampling for the algae. These algae have adapted to be living in extreme conditions, just wet, um, high calcium content, you find really interesting diatoms and other algal taxa that may be useful in being developed for algal biofuels. Becky's work with algae helped the rest of the team choose different strains that may perform well under the hot New Mexico sun and in its cold winters. One of those strains is Galderia sulfuaria, a mixotropic type of algae known in nature to thrive in high temperatures and acidic environments. Mixotropic organisms create energy from the sun and from the food they eat. 
Experiments in the lab at New Mexico State University show that Galdaria grows well in wastewater, converting carbon in the water to biomass. In other words, a mixotrophic algae system can reduce energy costs compared to current wastewater treatment systems. So we use the faculty startup funds from EPSCOR as a means to um, solidify our position within the university. And this is a very unique resource. It's the high resolution mass spectrometer that, that is here is the only one in this region. Um, we're the only folks doing this kind of work here. The team at New Mexico State under Dr. Omar Holguin scaled up these lab experiments and, in partnership with the city of Las Cruces, built and deployed an algal-based pilot-scale wastewater treatment system at the Las Cruces Wastewater Treatment Facility. Hi. Here we are at our test bed facility at the Las Cruces Wastewater Treatment. Um, here we have our Baldaria strains. It's an enclosed photo garden out here. The goal here is to see how efficient they remove nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water and then we can also harvest the biomass and then convert it to a fuel. So the significance here is that we can meet the discharge standards of, of the water facility within just a few days of the algae growing there and it's kind of a net energy zero uh, process because we can convert the biomass to a fuel and reclaim energy that way. So we can save them money and uh, have a greener, friendlier process. So far, the system has achieved over 90% removal of nitrogen, phosphates, and biochemical oxygen demand for primary sewage, meeting federal discharge standards in only four days. New Mexico State also experiments with other algae strains in side-by-side -side outdoor raceways to determine long-term growth stability in different conditions. Polycultures produce biomass densities capable of fuel conversion. Understanding how best to manage biological factors will be critical for future culture growth. EPSCOR-funded equipment is being used to harvest algae biomass and recycle the used water. The eastern side of New Mexico, home to three quarters of the state's 150 plus dairy farms, has to manage more than just urban wastewater. In an attempt to meet the demands of local conditions, Dr. Ju Chao Yan at Eastern New Mexico University is using an EPSCOR funded outdoor algae turf scrubber to purify dairy wastewater while producing algal biomass for energy production. Uh, this is our uh, algal turf scrubber. We use it to uh, cultivate algae in dairy manure affluence. In our uh, detention pond, we mix well fresh water with dairy manure affluence to form what's so called scrubber affluent. The affluent is pumped to our flowway and on the flowway, photosynthesis takes place. The reason we try to do this project firsthand we try to adapt algae cultivation to our local conditions for energy applications. And second, we try to use algae to purify with water. And this is a nexus of water, energy, and the environment. It's a win-win. Because of the success of the algal turf scrubber, a new partnership is underway with Dr. Yan and Southwest Cheese LLC for benchtop experiments growing algae with Cheeseway wastewater. If successful, the experiment will be scaled up for use with the algal turf scrubber. Because of Energize New Mexico, algae may become critical to the New Mexico energy economy of the future. With over 300 days of sunshine every year, New Mexico is prime real estate for solar energy research and utilization. But in order for solar energy to be economically viable for New Mexico's future, challenges with the effectiveness and efficiency of solar cells, devices, and processes must be mitigated. Energize New Mexico faces some of these challenges head on. At UNM, the solar energy team utilizes new spectroscopic methods at the Center for High-Tech Materials using equipment purchased with New Mexico EPSCOR funding. Spectroscopy is the measurement of light that is emitted, absorbed, or scattered by materials. The team modified and increased excited state lifetimes in photo-excited polymers, ultimately contributing to the design of more efficient solar cell materials. Yang Qin, Part of the UNM team recently published his work on 3D nanostructures using non-covalent bonding, 
which contributes to a greater understanding of organic solar cells. Teams at New Mexico State University and New Mexico Tech are focused on photocatalysts, substances that can speed up and maintain reactions similar to photosynthesis. At New Mexico State University, Solar Team members under Dr. Hong Mei Luo continue to investigate photocatalytic materials. I'm Swagatum. I'm, I'm working with Dr. Hong Mei Luo under the research grant from EPSCO. And we work on the solar project. As part of the third project in the summer, we are working with the carbon nitride, which can photocatalytically reduce. That means using the solar energy, we can reduce carbon dioxide, which is a, uh, which is a very very good project for the scientific background because of the sense of global warming and other measures. Project is being conducted in collaboration with the Santa Fe Community College. So we figured out a very decent way and very innovative way to perform not only to synthesize C3 and 4 which is carbon nitride as a photocatalyst but also split the layer as a, in the atomic level uh, so that we can perform better photocatalytic performance. This project is under investigation and we expect to uh, complete this by one or two months. At New Mexico Tech, Dr. Michael Hagee's team examines materials with the potential to catalyze the conversion of carbon dioxide to methanol. I'm Michael Hagee, professor of chemistry, and I'm one of the co-leads for the solar energy team. A lot of our mantra or our, our theme is, you know, earth abundant, non-toxic photocatalyst. So if there is a process that can be carried out, our um, idea is to generate photocatalysts that convert CO2 and bicarbonate into either value-added products like formate or even you know, internal combustion fuels like methanol. So that's one of the goals of our, our area. Graduate student Han Ching Pen was first to examine photocatalytic differences between two zinc sulfide materials on the reduction of carbon dioxide dissolved in water. The team found that zinc sulfide may be a promising catalyst due to its abundance and low toxicity. The team also discovered that glycerol, a green chemical solvent derived from vegetable oil, greatly improved the efficiency of the photocatalytic reduction. And so, um, you know, solar driven is where we like to be. So, yeah, really just we're going to the source with solar energy. EPSCOR solar research, combined with the state's abundant sunshine, provide a bright economic and environmental future for New Mexico. Even though the world needs alternative energy sources for the future, the New Mexico economy largely depends on oil and gas drilling in various parts of the state. In fact, in 2013, oil and gas provided 31.5% of New Mexico's general fund. We are sixth and seventh in the nation for oil and natural gas production, respectively. However, one of the downsides to drilling, both in the public's eyes and economically, is the amount of produced water generated by extraction. New Mexico alone generates 28 billion gallons of produced water per year. New Mexico EPSCOR's osmotic power component focuses on addressing the use of produced water as an energy source, making oil and gas extraction more efficient. I'm Frank Wong, professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Being with uh, EPSCOR since the uh, beginning, um, and it's the PI of osmotic uh, power generation uh, research group. Dr. Huang and his team have successfully fabricated custom membranes for a pressure-retarded osmosis power generation system. Membrane fabrication is key to success of the system. In order to do membrane research, we need uh, infrastructure. And so EPSCOR really provide a critical funding to build this infrastructure. Some of those equipment are being purchased, some of the equipment are actually being constructed and designed and constructed in-house. So we have, for example, fleshy casting machine used to make uh, fleshy membranes. And then we have the spinning process that uses the hollow fiber membranes. And then once you make the membrane, you will have to do the testing and characterize them. And so from the characterization and testing, we build high pressure PRO systems to check out the power generations. And then also how much water will be generated from the membrane distillation. There are other type of components to determine 
the porosity, the pore size of the membrane, which is very critical because the membrane itself is very thin, like 100 microns. And the pores is anywhere from 0.3 to about 1 microns. And so in order to measure those, we purchased a piece of equipment through a score funding called Parameter. So that's just some of the equipment that we purchased through the EBSCO funding. And I think that laid really critical foundation for us to have this infrastructure so we can continue our research on the, uh, on the member area. We just talk about the uh, infrastructure, but that's more from the equipment, the hardware type of you know, point of view. And software actually is even more important than hardware. The uh, university will build you know, nice buildings, but the building is nice Without the people inside, there's really nothing. There's no productivity. So I think another important critical component for EBSCO is the education, the training. For my particular group, is um, is really essential because we actually get a lot of undergrad interested in research. Before, like in my education so far, it's not really hands-on. It's more textbook. So this is like a great eye-opening and like I'm really enjoying the actual hands-on experience that I've been able to get with this project. It's, it's one of my favorite parts about working in this lab, um, actually being able to uh, work on things that as environmental we wouldn't actually get to do. I have learned so much working with Dr. Wong that, you know, and I've actually built a lot of skills both in the lab, um, computationally, you know, with my critical thinking skills, and so like, I think it's, it's been really cool. In-house here, we have three master's students that that's from undergrad as well, and they're all originally working in, in the EBSCO project. And the very last thing is the collaboration with industries. So we have strong collaboration. See, my belief is that, at least for me, when I do research, I don't stop at publication. I like to go and make the connection with the, uh, with the company. Because of their work on various membrane fouling issues, the team is now working in partnership with the geothermal team to extract and clean geothermal wastewater for use at Mason Greenhouse. This new partnership would not be possible without New Mexico EPSCOR. Of uranium. uranium mining has a long history in the American West. After World War II, the United States saw a boom in uranium mining, including in New Mexico, where until 1979, the state produced 50% of the country's supply of uranium. New Mexico holds the nation's second largest identified uranium ore reserves, but concerns remain about surface and underground contamination from these mines, long shut down and left abandoned, and there is little scientific understanding of how uranium molecules react to and move in the environment. For Energize New Mexico, the uranium transport and site remediation team's goal is to combat this lack of understanding through research, experimentation, and outreach. As a multidiscipline, interinstitutional component, collaboration is key to success. Our team has largely been involved working with Laguna Pueblo. They have been great partners on this, very supportive in helping us do our research. They're very interested in um, the dust transport study going on there because generations of their people have been impacted by the mine there. So they're very interested to know if uranium is being transported in dust today, um, and maybe what effects it had on them during the operations of the mine. It's been really enjoyable to, to work with them, and uh, they know the area better than anyone. And we're able to give them information on things that can't be directly seen, or uh, just developing a, a better picture of, of what's going on around Jack Pile. Uh, it, it seems to be well appreciated. After sampling soil and water at Laguna Pueblo and the Navajo Nation, team members examined the samples and characterized the molecules within using equipment purchased through Energize New Mexico. Equipment includes the milestone microwave, which heats the samples to break down the molecules, an anaerobic glove box for handling potentially radioactive materials, and, as Tina mentions, an advanced ICP-MS. How has EPSCOR helped your research? 
Uh, apps for actually from my whole research, I actually like uh, up to 80% of my research funding are from apps for like those fancy machines like SPMS and also the microscope for digestion and also my tuition. <laughs> Thank you, apps for. Do you think that? Having EPSCOR funding has encouraged you to continue your, this kind of research? Yes, of course. Absolutely. ICPMS stands for Inductively Coupled Plasma Mass Spectrometer, and in essence identifies and counts the type of molecules within the sample. As Dr. Lilia Foilova of New Mexico Tech explains, it's an incredible machine. And they submit a wonderful machine. So it allows you actually catch the uh, concentration on the running on the level of one PPP. So that is allowing me to see very how it is a tiny difference between my modifications and exactly to find the correct combination that is allow me to achieve my goal. With this, without this machine, you have no other methods to actually to catch and to pick so low the amount of radio. So because my goal is like 99.9 percent of radio out. Dr. Froilova, her colleague Dr. Cesna Rogeli, and her student Samantha Seville focus on new ways to mitigate uranium contamination. The three women recently applied for a patent for a new inorganic organic material that can specifically absorb uranium as an inexpensive reusable commercial filter. The UNM field team put their new equipment to good use and made several accomplishments. Samples from the Navajo Nation revealed the presence of uranium is two to five times higher than the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency maximum contaminant limit. Faculty and students published these findings in a journal for the American Chemical Society. The study is the first of its kind to identify chemical interactions between uranium and other elements with the environment. These published results provide new insights to the limited literature related to chemical interactions actions of uranium and demonstrate that mine wastes have the potential to release uranium, arsenic, and other metals rapidly into the water system, presenting a major source of potential exposure to nearby communities. Building on these findings, the team published another study, currently in revision, about uranium mobility in the Rio Paguate, downstream from the Jack Pile Mine on Laguna Pueblo. Their findings, that dilution and plants help decrease uranium concentrations, will contribute to contamination mitigation. Using soil samples from six sites near the Jackpile mine, New Mexico Tech students and faculty characterized the soil microbiome, including bacteria, with the potential to reduce uranium-6 to uranium-4. We'll let Olivia Chavez explain. Did you know that there are microbes that can interact with uranium? It reduces uranium-6 to uranium-4, which is an immobile version of uranium. I studied these microbes at the Jackpile mine in Laguna Pueblo. So far, we have found that we have both metal oxidizers and heavy metal reducers in the same soil. This means that we are probably not a candidate for bioremediation, but our data will help other mine sites around the world with their bioremediations. Because of the collaborative relationships established through Energize New Mexico, the New Mexico Environment Department reached out to some of our EPSCOR uranium team members for independent analysis of the effects and impacts of the 2015 Gold King mine spill. Energize New Mexico's contributions to human and research infrastructure will ensure that, should New Mexico resume mining our abundant uranium resources, we do not leave behind a legacy of contamination harmful to our people. New Mexico is a geologically active state, ranking sixth in the nation for geothermal energy potential. While some surface evidence exists for large geothermal systems, more detail lies below the ground. Exploring and utilizing geothermal resources may become important to New Mexico's economic future, but human technologies applied to natural systems can cause profound changes to other resources, such as groundwater. Energize New Mexico's geothermal energy resources component addresses the energy potential of these abundant geothermal resources and the economic and environmental implications of such systems. The University of New Mexico and New Mexico Tech join resources to determine the longevity and sustainability of New Mexico geothermal systems and assess degradation of surface and groundwater from systems across the state. Geothermal systems originate from heat in the mantle, deep below our feet.
Since we can't see or travel to the center of the Earth to map it, New Mexico EPSCoR funded infrastructure for creating the most accurate 3D and cross-sectional models of these systems. Equipment purchases include a Zonge Magnetotelluric system, the first of its kind in New Mexico. In Magnetotelurics, we, we record two things. We record variations in the Earth's magnetic field using induction coils like this one. And we measure variations in the Earth's electric field using specialized electrodes like these. New Mexico Tech deployed the magnetotelluric system at locations in southern New Mexico based on initial assessments in year one. Those assessments resulted in a statewide geochemical database. Essentially, they mapped unseen underground systems using trace elements often found in geothermal systems. As for the magnetotelluric system, 2D imaging shows potential geothermal upflow zone over the Socorro magma body on Sevilleta National Wildlife Refuge. Magnetotelluric and transient electromagnetic magnetic methods identified outflow plumes at Recon and Alamosa Creek south of Truth or Consequences. These results helped Jeff Pepin and his group develop a plan for geothermal sustainability in Truth or Consequences, indicating that resources have good potential for direct use of heat rather than for sustaining electric power. A new partnership with Mason Greenhouse is underway in collaboration with the Osmotic Power Component, and a collaboration with Los Alamos National Laboratories resulted in a new geothermal exploration map for southern New Mexico. Because of the detail the system provides, geothermal industry leader ORMAT Technologies will receive the magnetotelluric surveys directly to begin detailing the best places, if any, for geothermal prospecting. At the University of New Mexico, Dr. Laura Crossy and her team specialize in the Hamas geothermal system, beginning with the Valles Caldera National Preserve. Using geochemical detection equipment purchased through Energize New Mexico, the team identified geothermal sources and, more significantly, hydrologic flow paths. Measurements of geochemical tracers and carbon dioxide flux allowed Dr. Crossy and her students to map out an extension of the Valles Caldera system to the south, southwest, and northeast. Hi, I'm Jared Smith. I'm a master's student at the University of New Mexico. We're here on top of Soda Dam, which is a Fisher Ridge style travertine deposit. We just measured some CO2 flux down there around a diffuse areas, and right now we're on a structure, actually an intersection, intersecting, two intersecting structures right here, where we do see elevated CO2 flux. Now, what we do with our CO2 flux after we measure it is we multiply it by the area, which gives us the annual total flux of the area. And what we're coming out with around the Valles Caldera is a annual CO2 flux of around 54 megatons per year. Now to give that some perspective, uh, Mid-Oceanic Ridge has around the range of 97 megatons per year, and volcanic systems have anywhere between 53 to 74 megatons. So evidently we are in a dormant magmatic system that is still producing a massive amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. And these travertines record past CO2 depositing, past CO2 degassing along it, and right now we're studying the modern day CO2 degassing along these structures. And it kind of gives us some constraints for geothermal activity, geothermal systems um, from this magma chamber that's flying around two to three kilometers depth. In year two of the project, Energize New Mexico funding allowed for an inter-institutional graduate level course called Geothermal Energy, Tectonic Setting, Exploration, Production, and Sustainability. The class was a partnership between the University of New Mexico, New Mexico Tech, Sandia National Labs, and Los Alamos National Labs, and provided a unique opportunity to combine research with education as students actively engaged in field activities with team leaders. In the coming years, the geothermal team will merge the magnetotelluric data in two ways. First, with flow and transport models to assess permeability of rock and accessibility of certain systems. And second, with seismic and geochemical analyses to create detailed geologic models of the Valles Caldero geothermal system and the Socorro magma body. Collaborative efforts through New Mexico EPSCoR ensure cities, towns, industry, and policymakers have the information they need to make informed decisions about New Mexico's geothermal future. New Mexico's energy industries are important to the economy, yet are constrained by environmental impacts and water resources. Humans play an important part as well, especially when considering supply and demand for both energy and water. New Mexico needs to maintain its water and energy supply to its people, 
plus agricultural and ecosystem services that also use energy and water, but more people demand more energy and more water. So, how do we understand and efficiently navigate complex systems like these through the social and natural science nexus component of Energize New Mexico? System dynamics is a computer-aided approach to policy analysis and design. It applies to problems arising in complex systems over time. Team members work towards developing a system dynamics model linking complex natural and human systems to better understand the trade-offs that occur between different energy and economic development choices while considering the potential for socio-economic, environmental, and water use sustainability. As an arid climate, New Mexico's dwindling water resources are precious. However, the state's been long without a water budget, so the Social and Natural Science Nexus team hosted a workshop in year one to start developing a statewide water budget with scientists, experts, managers, and government representatives from across New Mexico. In partnership with the Office of the State Engineer, the Water Resources and Research Institute at New Mexico State University, led by Energized New Mexico co-lead San Fernald, combined data on evapotranspiration, precipitation estimates, surface flow statistics, groundwater capacities, and water use statistics to create the Dynamic Statewide Water Budget. For the first time, the Dynamic Statewide Water Budget synthesizes water supply and demand information from across the state into a single, easily accessible location. What we're shooting toward is a model that allows people to go on the web, click on their watershed, their county, their water planning region, and actually see the whole water budget and the different fluxes and where the surface and groundwater go. EPSCoR supported graduate students trained in system dynamics modeling and began research on case studies in the lower Rio Grande watershed. For example, they documented impacts of drought on the decline of groundwater storage and compared the energy cost of pumping groundwater to using surface water. The data will be integrated into the dynamic statewide water budget to determine trade-offs between water availability and energy or agricultural production. We're bumping up against the basically limits to use because we're in a drought. So that's why we need these data now and why they didn't have them before, because there wasn't this scarcity driving the need for the research like there is now. The dynamic statewide water budget is the first major step in completing the larger interdisciplinary system dynamics model integrating social and natural science research. Also essential in this model is the understanding of relationships between economic conditions and fossil fuel activity. Dr. Janie Chermak, team co-lead at UNM, focuses on the economic implications of energy development. In preparation for the full system dynamics model, Dr. Chermak and her team completed the first comprehensive statewide wide survey on attitudes and preferences towards various energy sources. While it was confirmed that residents living in oil producing counties favored an increase in oil production compared to the rest of the state, a majority of New Mexicans, regardless of their location, rank the environment as more important than the economy. This illustrates the complexity of creating a model with diverse opinions coupled with strong connections to the land and a reliance on fossil fuels. Modeling these relationships is imperative in order to develop a system dynamics model that can help develop a solid understanding of the linkage and trade-offs between energy, water, the environment, and the economy. The resulting system dynamics model will enable policymakers and researchers to compare and integrate information across many areas to address questions as New Mexico develops its energy future in a sustainable way. EBSCO has broadened my horizons on the scientific research um, that New Mexico is doing um, for renewable resources. Uh, they have given me two wonderful jobs. <laughs> um, they have paid me to travel and stay at different schools, mm -hmm. and all the research that I am doing for them has broadened my horizons, not only that, and um, it helps every, every school I go to that it seems to be applied, I can apply it more, so, and um, benefit that school as well. The uh, university will build, you know, nice buildings, but the building is nice without the people inside, it's really nothing, there's no productivity. So I think another important critical component for EPSCoR is the education, the training. Actually, like uh, up to 80% of my research funding are from EPSCoR, like those fancy machines like SPMS and al also the microscope for digestion and also my tuition. <laughs> Thank you, EPSCoR. 
I'm very, very excited about the research that I'm doing and I cannot be grateful enough to EPSCoR for creating such wonderful opportunities for students from different nationalities and gender. Thank you very much, EPSCoR. I'm really grateful to EPSCoR for giving me this opportunity and EPSCoR, you rock.